place, and she's wearing a really soft blue outfit, and she's wearing that white, what would you call that, a bonnet? I don't even know what you would call that. She's got that white sash, and we see this not just in church plays, but we also see this in nativities. Mary is nice, she's cute, she's quaint, she's soft, she's gentle, but let me read for you something that soft, cute, gentle Mary sings when she hears that God is going to use her to birth the Savior. And perhaps this will give you some perspective on cute little Mary. My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. This isn't his mercy extends to those who fear His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham, and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. When Mary receives this message that she is going to birth the Son of God, that 15-year-old Jewish peasant is no longer what we believe this soft, cute, gentle gal. I mean, she just rips out this explosive song, this Mary is Bold and she is passionate. Why? Because she, along with the rest of her people, know what deep, dark oppression is like. They have been under oppression for centuries, 400 years of being dominated by empire after empire after empire. And you know what's crazy is when you are told from a very small child that you are God's chosen people, guess what that does to your mind when you are ruled over my people that do not bow to the same God that, that works your mind over. And so Mary, these soft, gentle, cute images we can all take those and ball them up and throw them in the trash because Mary is bold and she's passionate. I mean, she just whips this song out there. Here's the deal. When you look at Mary's song, you will notice, if you pay attention, that it reaches this crescendo. It's like the song just builds. And it's not just she's expressing her gratitude. Suddenly she begins to talk about God's action God's justice. Things suddenly get very real. Rulers will be tossed off their thrones. The humble will be exalted. The rich will be sent away empty. I mean, suddenly, it's like everything is being turned upside down. Cute, quaint Mary is suddenly a very, very different Mary that we are not very familiar with. Folks, I mean, this, this is revolution. I mean, this... This is revolution. This is like everything getting turned upside down. This is like we're at that infamous kids' table at Christmas dinner. How many of you know that table? How many of you sat at the kids' table Christmas dinner? You're like cast off. You're put in another room. You're exiled. Right? And then when you start whining for more food, there is no sound from the dining room. There's nothing. They leave you there. This is like we're all sitting around the kids' table, you and I, and we're arguing and we're bickering about who's going to play the iPad after dinner and who is going to play the Xbox and who's going to pick the board game. And then someone gets up from the adult table, grabs the table by its ends, and just rips the thing up, sending everything crashing on the floor. This is what God is doing through this newborn, innocent child. Everything is getting turned completely upside down. In other words, God is throwing down. I mean, he is just right. It is time, 
time's up. The time is now. Everything is being turned upside down. Everything. Nothing is going to be the same. In the words of that singer Adele, God is turning those tables. I mean, everything upside down. Why? Because this is God's world. This is God's world. It always has been God's world. And it always will be God's world. And so whenever someone or some ruler or some person kind of claims like they're at the center of this existence, God is always going to break in and turn the table just like we see in this newborn child. You see, the scandal at the heart of the Christian faith is that it's in that newborn child that we see in Bethlehem that this child has entered this very dark period in the history of Israel, but not just in the history of Israel, in the history of the entire world. At this moment when Jesus is born, the world is either going to go this way and keep going this way, or it's going to turn the corner. And then God breaks in in this innocent, vulnerable child. He doesn't come riding in with the Calvary. He comes in the form of an innocent child who has to be cared for by peasants, by people. God becomes one of us so he can make us what he is. Now, we've listened to the Christmas story over and over. We've heard the passages read out of the scripture. We've sung a lots of the carols. We've read our devotionals. We've lit our candles. We've sung Silent Night. We've seen all this. But I would say, if we really pulled back the layers on the Christmas story, I would argue that we would really have a tough time understanding the revolution that is Christmas. Because let's be honest, we all live in relative comfort. We're all good. When was the last time we actually had to live on the underside of power? When was the last time like we were truly, truly oppressed? Truly. And so suddenly when we're hit with the Christmas story, I would argue that we would hear it over and over and over. And it's like, wow, this is nice. This is, this is beautiful. This is comforting. God with us. But if you would have experienced what it was like to hear that a Savior has been born to you, you would suddenly understand the ramifications, especially when your people have been under oppression for 400 years. I would argue that for a lot of us, we just don't really know what to do. We can't see all the dimensions of the Christmas story and what it means. Sure, we understand God has saved us from our sins, and we are grateful when we worship, and that's huge. But imagine being on the underside of oppressive power and hearing that announcement that a Savior has been born. That, that's revolution. That's revolution. If we were to sit down, if we were to sit down with Mary and we were to ask her, what kind of salvation is this? Because in this child, there is this massive rescue operation underway. There is this salvation that is breaking in here and now. God is not announcing, hey, in the sweet by and by, everything's going to be great. Just hold on, Mary. This is about salvation here, now. This is about healing here, now. A healing that happens now and carries on into the future. <coughs> salvation now, here, on earth, but also when we carry on into that next life. If we were to sit down with Mary and we were to look into Mary's eyes and ask her her thoughts on salvation, would she tell us that this child represents what we believe salvation to be? We've largely understood salvation to be about our souls going off to this place called heaven. But what if salvation encompassed more than just the spiritual? So we do a great job. Well, this is our spiritual life. This is the rest of our life. But you have to understand, like, there was no word in the Hebrew language for spirituality. There was no word. Why? Everything was spiritual. Physical. Mental. Everything was spiritual. I mean, is this about like a spiritual liberation? But is, or is this also about physical and mental and emotional liberation? Is this about God wanting to heal the entirety of us? You cannot compartmentalize and separate all of them. It encompasses everything. Is God in the Christ child dealing with our naughty, naughty acts? 
shame on us? Or is God dealing with all the things that strip away our humanity? Because that's essentially what sin is. Strips away the God-given dignity that you have. It is not, oh, you misbehaved. It is this sin, this behavior, this action is stealing from who you were always meant to be. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. You're going to understand why we turn there in a minute. Now, when we hit the book of 1 Samuel, we are essentially reading one of the finest works of history in the ancient world. And scholars and historians, whether they're believers or not, will all say this is one of the finest works of ancient history. And it's the history of Israel's formation. Because at this point in Israel's story, Israel's story. Israel is either going to come together and be formed as a nation, or they are going to continue to be fragmented and all over the place. And it's here that we are introduced to a young girl named Hannah. Actually, she's not young. And Hannah is barren. And we have to understand in this culture, when you are barren, that is actually a sign for people that you are not blessed by God. Apparently, the God's blessing isn't on you because you can't conceive a child. And then Hannah receives this announcement that she's going to birth a son. I mean, Hannah is a representative of God, of being a faithful, God-honoring woman. And it's at this very pivotal moment in Israel's history that God gives her a son and then she comes out with this prayer and this prayer was probably sung. Read along with me. Verse 1, chapter 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high and my mouth boasts over my enemies for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows. And by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken. But those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. And he lifts the needy from the ash heap. And he sends them, he seats them with the princes. And he has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. But the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven, and the Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of the anointed. Does this sound familiar? It sounds a lot like Mary's words. And we have this long line of strong, bold, passionate women in the scriptures and there, you know, a lot of people struggle when women take up places of leadership, but if you search the scriptures, there is a lot, there are a lot of women who take up these places of leadership, and they have done amazing, profound works. Why? Because God is on the side of the brokenhearted, he's on the side of the oppressed, and God will use whosoever heart is open to be used. So... Now Hannah, she ends her prayer by saying this. She ends her prayer by saying this. God will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, 
the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, they are speaking of Israel's formation as a nation. And when Hannah gives birth, she gives birth to a son named Samuel. Samuel is going to anoint King David. King David, one of the most well-known kings in all of ancient history. King David brought Israel from this nation that was forming itself, trying to get itself together, and King David brings it all the way to the pinnacle of its existence. And this is what the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel are talking about. But Hannah's prayer isn't just about David and Israel. It's also pointing to something bigger that's on the horizon. Something that encompasses all of us. You, me, your neighbor, the people you rub shoulders with every day at the grocery store, at work. It encompasses all of us, this entire world. And there's a reason that Luke records Mary's song. There is a reason he puts this in there. Her song is deeply reminiscent of Hannah's, but Mary's song is different because it is not just sung at a pivotal moment in the life of Israel. It's sung at a pivotal moment in the life of the world. The world is either going to keep going this way and just continue destructing and degrading and being destroyed, or it's going to finally turn the corner. And then Mary receives this word. She's going to bear this child who is going to reign over the entire world, who is going to bring the healing and salvation here, now, and also in the future. This is something that you and I are all longing for. Jesus enters a very dark world at a very dark time. And he's born to people who are on the receiving end of every single oppression you can imagine. Insane taxation, violence, aggression, hate to people who are hungry, to people who are in poverty. Jesus enters the world to people whose hopes are fading. And the scandal of the child in that manger, that feeding trough in Bethlehem, is that God has become one of the oppressed. The Lord has become the broken. The master has become the slave. This is the most profound story there is amongst all the different faith traditions. Every other faith tradition, every other religion, with all due respect, they speak of us trying to get to God. The Christian faith is the only faith that speaks of a God who comes down to our level and meets us in those oppressed, beat up positions and states. That is the scandal of that child who is lying in that feeding trough. Now, Mary comes from this long line of strong, bold, passionate Jewish women. But in Luke's Gospel, Mary is something more. Like Hannah, Mary is a representative of faithfulness, but Mary is also a representative of a new people that God is birthing in the world. And these are the types of people that are going to partner with God in what He is doing here. God is looking for a people. God is looking for people to partner with Him. And He is not looking for pastors alone. He is looking for people. Ordinary people like myself, like you, to join Him in what He is doing in this world. Now, I want you to listen closely to this story. Listen close. This is a pastor speaking about a story, speak, telling this story about an experience he had. He said, this stop turned out to be a community home for men dying of AIDS. And he said, when I discovered where we were, I was surprised by how apprehensive I felt. I had spent a lot of time around dying people, so that wasn't it. Maybe I was self-conscious about being around gay men and needle addicts. Most of the men who live here have no one to take care of them, Angelina said. 
Their families have disowned them, and their friends have stopped visiting. We help them die with dignity, and hopefully they see Jesus in us. The house was quiet, except for a cat that was meowing in some faraway room. And the three of us walked up the stairs to the second floor, and through open doors we could see men in different stages of illness. And some were propped up in bed reading, others slept. At the top of the third floor landing, a petite young woman with close cropped hair and a beaming smile was waiting for us. Ava shook my hand, and she said, you've come just in time. We need to give the men baths. Angelina placed her hand on my arm and she said, we could use you up here, she said. My heart was beating like a drum up against my ribcage just at the idea of giving another man a bath. And I scrambled for a reason why I couldn't possibly help, but I wasn't fast enough. And Angelina took my hand and we went into a room where a young man lay on a bed staring blankly at the ceiling. Buongiorno, Amadeo, Angelina said. I have brought a friend today. Angelina removed the blanket that covered Amadeo's body. He was a naked stick, mute, his almond-shaped eyes filled with that pitiful mixture of panic and confusion. His skin hung flaccidly. He must have been six feet tall once, but now he surely weighed less than a hundred pounds. And I felt a rush of both shock and sadness. And I looked at Angelina for help, and she smiled at me reassuringly. She said, let's put Amadeo in the tub. And as she repeated in Italian, she repeated that in Italian so that Amadeo would know exactly what they were doing. And so they lowered him into the bathtub. And as soon as they did that, his body kind of winced as the open sores on his body made contact with the water. Angelina spoke to him soothingly while sponging off his brittle frame. And she handed me a rag. And in the humbling of questions, she asked this. Would you mind washing his genitals? And I was speechless. And the stick man looked at me as if to say, what will you choose to do now? As I pushed against my revulsion, and I plunged the sponge beneath the water, I thought of it again, but I refused its invitation to hold it back. And I passed through a border into the depths and found I could still breathe there. My terror and embarrassment was replaced with a sublime peace and a sublime joy. We lifted Amadeo out of the tub and placed him on the bed where Ava had placed fresh towels. We patted him dry and gingerly dabbed ointment on his sores. When we were finished, Ava put a blanket over him. Angelina put her face close to his and said, goodbye, my friend. I will look in on you tomorrow. While we were walking down the stairs as we left, Maggie came out of one of the rooms met us in the hall. I must have looked dazed because she looked sideways at me. What happened up there, she asked. And the pastor said, I think I became a Christian. Being a Christian is about being caught up in God's story of restoration. Being a Christian is about allowing God to restore and shape you into who you were always meant to be. And being a Christian isn't just about being restored. It's about actively partnering with what God is doing here, restoring and healing people. God is looking for a people to join him in what he's doing. The scandal of the Christmas story is that God became what we are to make us what he is. And in everything we do, we are either announcing that reality or we are not. In every way we live, we are either announcing the fact that God is bringing healing and restoration and salvation here or we are not. So from the person you most disagree with, to the person that you do agree with, to the person that you just struggle with all the time because of their views on things, from the poorest of the poor to the wealthiest of people, to the family trapped in poverty, to the single mom who's just trying to make ends meet, to the Muslim, to the refugee, to the gay man or the gay woman, to the addict, to the sinner, 
to the broken in every conversation, in every word of grace, in every act of forgiveness, in every act of service. You are putting flesh and blood on Mary's song. That God is the God of the broken that God is the God of the oppressed. That God is the God of salvation. And we are either announcing this reality or we're not. We are either living this reality and showing it to be true or we are simply telling the same story that the world is telling. We're just giving a little Jesus on the side. We are either saying that God has broken into human history and a whole new world has broken in and that God is bringing hope and healing and salvation or we are just saying the same old thing and we are just saying hey one day it will be okay God's salvation has come now just as it had come when that child was born in the rain let's pray together Christ